as we get started in your lives as Christians, most of us know and understand that, you know, there's a wide range of Christians. There's a wide range of maturity levels in Christians, you know, from new, just saved people who don't know anything about Christ to long-term Christians who have been Christians since they could speak. They, they were born and raised and have grown up in the church, and when they got old enough to, to affirm their faith, they've called upon the name of Jesus Christ, and they, they live lives exemplary to the Word of God. It, it, there's a wide range of Christians out there. Well, in the Gospel of Matthew, there's a story that I want to bring to your attention. It's called The Laborers in the Vineyards. It's in chapter 20, the first, I think, uh, 16 verses. It, it, Jesus is speaking here, and he's talking about the laborers. And in, uh, in the gist of the story, what happens is the laborer, he, the, the, labor, the guy who owns the vineyards, the master of the house, it's time to bring in the harvest. So he goes out early in the morning and he finds people on the street and he tells them, if, if, if you know, come and work in the field and I'll pay you a denarius. So they go to work early in the morning, go out to the fields and they begin their journey. They begin their work. Well, on the, at the sixth hour, the ninth hour, he also goes back out again into the street and he, he does the same thing. Finds people standing around saying, you know, I'll give you a denarius to come and work in the fields, bring in the harvest. Well, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, roll around. He goes back out to the street and gathers more people up, standing around. He said, if you'll come out to the field and work, I'll give you a denarius. 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, same thing. He goes out, still looking for more workers, finds them, sends them out to the field. I'll, I'll give you a denarius to come and work in the field. But as the day comes to a close and everybody's done their works, he sends his servants out to bring in the workers, beginning from the last ones he went and got, and pay them. So the ones that just started working an hour or two ago come out and, and he pays them a denarius. And the ones that started two or three hours ago, they come out and he pays them a denarius. The ones that have been there three or four hours come out and he pays them a denarius. The ones that have been there all day long come out and he pays them a denarius. Well, the people who had been there all day started complaining and moaning and, and groaning to the master of the house, saying, you should give us more. We, we've worked all day long. And, and the master of the house says, I've given you what we agreed upon. Now, Go about your business. Now, as Christians, this applies to us for the simple reason that there are many of us who have started at different times in our lives. Some of us have grown up in churches. Some of us have got saved later in life. Some of us just now are beginning in Christianity. And we're at all different levels of that walk life. Remember the story of the, the son who went and asked his dad for his inheritance and he left and went off to the city and he spent all of his money and he got broke and he got hungry and he, he, he found that he couldn't make a living on his own so he goes back to his dad's and, and he says, let me be a servant for you treat your servants better because I'm not worthy. And his father greets him and he grabs him and he hugs him and he says, come, let's have a feast. And he, he kills the fattened calf and he has a big old party for the son that come home. And, and the, the brother who had been there the whole time gets angry with, with his father and says, what are you doing? You've never killed a fattened calf for me. And the father said, my son was lost, but now he's found. You should rejoice, you should be glad. Both of those stories, as Christians, no matter where you're at in your, your walk with Christ, 
you become a Christian, you get saved, you start to follow Jesus, and you start to learn about these things we call covenants, these promises that God has made to us. And it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian all your life or if you just got saved this week. All those covenant promises are yours. What we see in both those stories is the ones who have been working longer, those who have been in the fields, those who have been laboring in the vineyard, every now and then we get a little jealous. When God bestows all that blessing, all that promise on those who just are getting to know Him. They're just now meeting Him. You know, and, and both, both these stories show us where the master of the house, that would be God, Jesus Christ, looks at His servants who have been with Him all the time and he says, all that I have is yours. I haven't broken my promises. I'm not showing favoritism. I'm not giving them more. I'm giving them the same thing that I give you. You see, that's, that's the glory of God's salvation. Is he has made all these promises. He has told all his people... If you do these things, then I will do these things. And he put no time limit on it. God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, blesses those who follow him, right? I mean, we, we tell me, do, do you like it when God answers your, your prayers? I, I don't like it when God answers mine. I kind of know he's there. When my prayers get answered, I kind of it kind of fills me with, with the joy of God to know that when I pray according to God's will, according according to God's word, and His word comes to pass, it shows me that He is truth and that He is life and He is holy because He keeps His promises. How do you feel when God answers your prayers? And most of you agree that you like that, right? But when you look out into the world and you see these new, immature Christians that abuse the Word of God and they take their misconceptions and, and they... They try to say that God's Word says things that it don't say, but they do know that Jesus is Lord and Savior, and, and their prayers are getting answered, and things are happening in their lives. And you look at, and, and you think, my goodness, they have so much they've got to learn. I can't believe God would do that for them, knowing that I can't believe God answered that prayer. Did you hear the way they prayed that? Don't they know what God's Word says? You know, all that I have is yours. As a Christian, sometimes we look at other Christians and we're jealous. Not necessarily in a bad sense, but we kind of like what God's doing in their lives, and we'd like a little more of that in ours, right? Or, or you've been a, a long-time Christian, and, and you know the consequences of bad behavior, and you see these new Christians who are, are getting saved, and they're starting to learn about God, but they're still living with so many sins in their lives, and, and, and God is just blessing them right and left, and, and, and you're like, what are you thinking, God? You know, they're doing this, and they're doing this, and they're doing this, and they shouldn't be doing that. They ought to know better than that. Boy, if I did that, you would just chastise the fire out of me. Yeah. Christian maturity. 
the more you know, the more you hope you're accountable for. But if you think back, been a Christian for a few years, or you were raised in church, and you were taught at very young ages to behave in certain ways and to do certain things because that's God's, God's command, and, and you live with a blessing because you follow that. Day in, day out, week after week, month after month, year after year, you have received all these blessings. that new Christian over there don't have a clue yet just started don't even really know what a tithe is yet he's getting blessed somebody's told him he needs to give a little money to the church and, and God's just started plastering him with money from everywhere so that he can do it well that's not fair but you've had it all your life And God says, God says to his servants, all that I have is yours. All that I have, I've given to you. You're in my house. You're part of my family. You live in my blessing. They get a denary too. He promised to give you what was his. And he does. Because you know him. You seek Him. Search Him. Because you labor in the vineyard. It doesn't matter at what point you walk into the vineyard to labor for the Master. What He promised is yours. Are you receiving the blessings of God? Is God answering your prayers? Are you living the life that gives glory to God? You know, all that He has is yours. He has taught you since you began to know Him. If you'll do these things, I will do these things for you. And every time you do those things, he does what he says he'll do. Mature Christians rejoice when they see that new Christian receiving those blessings. How much grace has God given you in your life since you have found Him. Since you began to seek Him. How many answered prayer? How many times of grace? How many times have you had to say, forgive me? Think about all the years of grace and love and mercy and forgiveness that God gives to you. That God has given you. And compare it to those who just come to work. Sometimes it seems like they get away with a whole lot more than we do. Doesn't it? I remember a time when God's mercy and grace seemed to be a whole lot more than it is now. I remember when I, when I first got saved, how people would come up to me and, and say, God 
God's doing everything you ask. Where do you get that much faith? I had a, a lady walk up to me and, and say, How can you have so much faith? It seems like every time you come to a prayer meeting and you get out and pray, it's not two or three days and God's already done what you've asked for. I've been praying for 50 years. And sometimes He don't answer my prayers. I don't know if I answered that question. Looking back, since then, I, when I see all the, all the prayers that don't get answered, when I, when I see all the things that I ask God for, and I ask God to do, now, now I see more things that don't happen than do. And don't get me wrong. God still answers a whole lot of prayers that I ask. At the maturity level, why I'm asking, how I'm asking, my obedience, God expects more. God rewards people because he made promises. He said, what I have is yours if you believe. And in the covenants throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, that's that if then clause. If you will do this, if you will be my people, I will be your God. If you pay your tithes, I will open up the gateway of heaven and pour you out a blessing greater than you can receive. If, if my people would humble themselves and pray, I will hear them and I will answer. If you repent of your sins, I will forgive you. Those are promises. There's so many of them I couldn't even begin to name them all in the service. <clears throat> But every time that you see a prayer, every time that you see that commandment, if you do this, then I will do this. That's the choice you have to be obedient or not to be obedient. If you don't, confess your sins, then I won't forgive you for it. If you don't believe in me, I won't save you. If you don't turn around and walk away from my sin, from your sin, I will allow you to live in it and allow you to pay the consequences for it. If you don't forgive them, I won't forgive you. See, God's, God's Word is promise and it's truth. If you do it, he will bless. If you don't, he will curse. God, he says, all that I have is yours. It doesn't matter if you've been here for a minute or for 50 years. My promises are my promises. That's the way it is. That's the truth in the Word of God. That's why... It is so rich. That's why it is so powerful. That is why he is so full of glory. Is because if you will follow me, 
if you will believe in me. If you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, then I will save you. In a moment, we're going to partake of Holy Communion. And as we prepare to take Holy Communion, I want you to think about how mature you are in your Christian life. I want you to think about the promises that God has made. I want you to remember the things that God has done in your life. day in and day out since you met him. Let's pray. Father God, Lord Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit, as we come before you this morning, we thank you and praise you for being the God of our salvation. Father God, we we turn to you and place our trust in you. We ask that you would give us strength and courage to be the Christians, to be the people that you have called us to be. Father, we know we're not perfect. Father God, we know we fall short. Father God, we know we fail. But Lord, it is you that we are seeking. Your love, your grace, your mercy, your truth in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, As we enter into Holy Communion, George and Jane, would you step front? The Apostle Paul reminds us that on the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, that he had put bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. To do this in remembrance of me. And he he lifted the bread and he, he broke it. He tore it apart. And after supper, when he had given thanks, he lifted up the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In remembrance of me. As the elements are passed, please hold until all have received. As you receive the bread, I want you to remember what it symbolizes. The bread is the body of the Christ. This is God who was born as man through the Virgin Mary, who lived a perfect and holy life under the law of God, who was judged for our sin, was accused, arrested, tried, prosecuted, and convicted for our sins because we demanded his life. 
This is the body which was beaten, which was mocked, humiliated, spit upon. This is the body where the cross was placed on his shoulders and he carried it up a mountain. This is a cross where we nailed his body to. This is the body that we pierced with a sword. the symbol of the blood of Christ. As that body went through all these trials, as it was beaten, mocked, humiliated, as it was pierced with nails and pierced with a sword, as he sweat drops of blood and cried tears of blood, he poured out his blood to seal you in his cup body that suffered and the blood that sealed. What we do as we celebrate this meal is we proclaim that God loved us and sent His Son for us. That His Son paid the price through the suffering of His body. And He gave His life through the shedding of His blood. We proclaim that on the third day he walked out of the tomb with the debt of sin paid for so that we can have life through him. So when we celebrate this meal, when you partake of this body and of this blood, you are saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior and that through him I now have life. Let us partake of the bread from heaven together. And let us partake of the blood of the new covenant together. As we prepare to close today's service, know that you and I are the laborers, and that our work and our life is for the Master the one that has lived and died and rose for us. Let us call upon his name and trust that he will fulfill his word in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.